two groups of students, and it's important to note at the outset that the prefrontal cortex doesn't just keep stuff in working memory or allow us to invent you know, new ways to escape fire. It's also important for stuff like self-control, willpower, delayed gratification. So it's got to, it's got to do a lot of stuff. You know, there's a heavy burden for this brain area. So back to the psychology experiment, he had two groups of students. One group had to remember a two-digit random number. The other group had to remember a seven-digit random number. He told the students this was a test of long-term memory, but he was lying. He then marched the students down the hall where they had a choice of fruit salad, the responsible option, or a gooey, rich slice of chocolate cake. What he found was that the students given seven digits to remember were almost twice as likely to choose chocolate cake as a student's given two digits. And that's simply because all it took was five extra numbers to, in a sense, short-circuit the prefrontal cortex, to overwhelm it. So there wasn't enough processing power left over to actually resist the slice of chocolate cake. And I think that illustrates <laughs> just, just, ju just how bounded this, this bit of brain is. Um, and why sometimes, in some circumstances, it can actually lead us astray. So I'll give you another example of, of when it can be wise to, I think, trust your emotional brain. This is an experiment done by a neuroscientist named Antonio Damasio. It's known as the Iowa Gambling Task. And the experiment goes like this. There are four decks of cards. Each deck, two decks are much better than the others. But each deck, you pick up a card and it'll say, you won $75 or you lost $200 or you, know, you won $10 and so on. And so the job of these subjects in the experiment is to pick up decks from these cards until they figure out which decks are the best. And so when you give people these four decks of cards, what you find is that it takes about 50 to 60 cards before people can explain why one deck is better than the other. You have to draw a lot of cards. Logic is slow. It takes a while to accumulate enough evidence in order to realize that one deck is the best and the other three decks aren't so good. However, when you hook up people's hands to a machine that measures the electrical skin conductance, so that measures anxiety, stress, nervousness, what you find is that their hands start to get nervous, their hands start to get sweaty whenever they reach for the bad decks of cards after only six or seven cards. So in a sense, their hand, their emotional brain, knows much more than they know. It's, it's responding to facts. It's taking in information much quicker than their rational brain is. So, so that's just a small example in the mm -hmm. book. I talk about that in terms of professional poker players and mm -hmm. how poker players have learned. You know, They have to really practice listening and learning and eavesdropping on their emotional brain but how really what they're picking up on is, is those very subtle signals, those sweaty palms that allow them to act on information they may, they may have no conscious awareness of. So some of that is, is uh, pattern recognition when you've been doing something like playing poker yeah. or flying a plane or whatever. You can pick up, you can sense differences in the situation on an emotional level that you can't rationally. Absolutely. I think that's what the emotional brain is so good at, is, is detecting these patterns in reality that, that because of the processing power limitations of the rational brain kind of elude the prefrontal cortex. And yet, you know, the unconscious knows much more than we know. It's taking in far more information than we're aware of. I mean, another great experiment that demonstrates this was done by psychologists in Germany. They had people watch a soap opera, and at the bottom of the soap opera was a ticker tape, like you see on CNBC, you know, stocks going up or down, fluctuating in value. There were 20 different stocks on this ticker tape. And so you have people watch the soap opera and watch the ticker tape for half an hour, and then you ask them, you know, which stocks went up? Which stocks did the best? And they'll say, I have no idea. That was way too much information. I, I can't begin to tell you which stocks did best. However, when you ask them, okay, okay, which stocks feel the best? Just tell us which stocks are associated with the most positive emotions. What you find is that now, all of a sudden, their emotional brain is actually really accurate at telling you which stocks did well. That's because even though you have no conscious awareness of, of the ticker tape, you know, that, that was way too much information from your prefrontal cortex to handle, your emotional brain took in this information and processed it and then generates emotions, these very subtle feelings that kind of guide your actions and tell you what to do. So I think it's these kind of instances, and this is pretty counterintuitive. I think most of us might trust our you know, gut instincts to pick a dish for dinner, order something off a menu, but we never trust it to pick a stock or, or to make a complex decision. And you know, what the science suggests, and there's some initial evidence to support this, is that it's the really hard decisions in life, the decisions that involve lots and lots of information, lots of variables, that most benefit from a more emotional thought process. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the um, the opera singer who got kind of messed up by overthinking and that kind of 
short-circuiting of your skills by thinking too much. Well, this is, this is known as choking. We're all familiar with it. We've all seen Shaq try to make free throws or watch golfers implode on the 18th hole. And, and what choking seems to be, and this, a lot of this work is done by a professor of psychology named Sean Baylock at Northwestern University, is simply we're thinking too much. We become too self-conscious. So what she actually does is she brings in novice golfers and professional golfers into her lab, and she First, what she shows is that novice golfers do better when they think about their strokes and when they contemplate the details of a golf swing. So they think about keeping their wrists taut and keeping their elbows tucked in and their hips straight and all the stuff that golfers have to think about when they're learning how to swing a golf club. That thinking about a golf stroke when you're a beginner makes you hit better, makes you hit better, you know, makes you hit the ball better because you avoid beginners' mistakes. However, when she brings in professional golfers into her lab and tells them to pay attention to their torqued wrist or, you know, keeping their elbows in, all of a sudden now they choke. They become so focused on keeping their elbows in that they lose the natural fluidity of motion that they've trained for, that they've practiced all these years. So they've taken the skill on autopilot that's performed best on autopilot and transferred it over to their deliberative brain. And that's where things start to backfire. And that's so when opera singers choke and mm -hmm. baseball pitchers start missing the strike zone and golfers, their swing breaks down. So, so become when so Renee self Fleming thinks about, is she going to hit the high A? That's and when she misses it. Exactly. And so it's important to know the, that there are moments of everyday life, like driving, like if you're a professional golfer, like hitting a golf ball, or if you're an opera singer, like singing in a, you know, singing in opera, that are best performed on autopilot, that are best performed by the you know, trained neurons in the emotional brain. And, and it, it sounded like picking art was one of those things. You mentioned a study where people had a choice of a poster of a Van Gogh or a Monet or kitties. Yes. And when they started to think about it, they picked the kitties. And when they didn't think about it, they picked the the art. Yeah, and, and you survey them after the fact, and it turns out that uh, people like, pe people prefer the art. This is work done by Timothy Wilson at the University of Virginia, and he also did a study on strawberry jam, where he, Consumer Reports in the mid-80s, did an exhaustive survey of strawberry jams, where they ranked the top 55 strawberry jams in the country. So Acme was near the top, Knott's Berry Farm was up there, Smuckers was up there, et cetera, et cetera. He was curious if undergraduate students would share the same preferences as these tasting experts at Consumer Reports. What he found was that if you just gave these jams to undergraduate students, that they were pretty good at finding the best jams, at least according to Consumer Reports, and that there was this very strong correlation between the jams preferred by students and the jams preferred by Consumer Reports. However, all of a sudden you ask people to explain why they like one jam as opposed to another jam, now the correlation all but disappeared. Some of the worst tasting jams, according to Consumer Reports, were ranked highest by these students who had to explain their decisions. And the reason is simple, that when you give someone a jam and they taste the jam but they have to come up with a reason for it, they go, hmm, this jam has a chunky texture. And they think, you know, chunky texture, I don't like chunky textures, that's a good reason to not like a jam, when the reality is they may very well not even care about texture, or they may even like chunky texture. But when you start searching for reasons, you know, rational reasons, to prefer one jam over another, you end up overriding these subtle preferences that your brain is actually trying to tell you. Another way that you talked about the way that our um, rational minds trick us was with... Um, the placebo effect and also with, um, you know, when, when we have an expectation of something, like when you tell someone a wine is really expensive, then you're going to say, I love that wine. And when you tell them that the same wine is really cheap, they're like, oh, it just, you know, it's a little too fruit forward yeah. for me. Can you talk about that a little? Sure. I mean, the placebo effect is very powerful. I think it's easy to make fun of it, but we often forget that all medicine was, until 100 years ago, was the placebo effect. That, that, that's all we had to heal us. And, and it's, it's, still, it's still very tough for many conditions to design a drug that works better than the placebo effect in controlled tests. So the placebo effect is very powerful. And, and what you see when you put people in a brain scan or put them in an FM, fMRI machine and you give them a hand moisturizer, and but tell them this is a very powerful new painkiller, and then give them electrical shock, but tell them that you know right afterwards we're going to put this 
powerful painkiller on that's actually hand moisturizer, what you see is parts of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the quote-unquote rational brain, lights up because they expect to feel less pain, and so their insula, this brain area that actually responds to things like bodily pain, is less active, simply because they expect to feel less pain. So you can actually watch the placebo effect in action. This is studies done by scientists at Columbia University. And, and the and this, this same phenomena is at work all the time in everyday life. So I talk about another set of experiments done where people actually had, this is done by scientists at Caltech, where they actually had people sip wine via long plastic tubes in a brain scanner, and they had people sample three different wines, but told them they're actually five different wines. So they told them, this so then sample a $5 wine, a $15 bottle of wine, and a $90 bottle of wine. Sure enough, when you tell people they're sampling a $90 bottle of wine, they say, oh, this is my favorite. This is the most elegant, refined wine. Such delicious fruit. Oh, I can taste the raspberries. On and on and on. And you see parts of the brain that respond to pleasure light up much more when they're tasting a $90 bottle of wine, even if even if that $90 bottle of wine is actually $15. So even if you give them a cheap wine and tell them it's expensive, you still see the same pattern of pleasurable activation in the brain. The interesting kind of, I think the you know, end note to the story is that when they gave the wines to the volunteers, even trained wine tasting volunteers, so people who know what they're talking about in theory, they gave them all these wines but completely blind. The favorite wine of just about everybody was the $5 bottle of wine. <laughs> so, so when you deprive the brain of its placebo expectations of the fact that we expect the most expensive wines to taste the best, it turns out we actually like the cheap plonk most of all um, and, 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 this, uh, you know, and this isn't just they did this with the Stanford Wine Club and I don't want to just pick on the Stanford Wine Club there are a whole set of other experiments done by research at the University of Bordeaux where they had trained French wine critics and they served them a very cheap two dollar bottle of you know wine the hearty burgundy in those big plastic jugs and they served this bottle of wine in a cheap bottle of wine but also in a very expensive first class Bordeaux bottle of wine. So the exact same wine in two different bottles and they asked the wine critics, professional wine critics, to describe these two wines. Needless to say, when the cheap wine was in the expensive bottle, it was elegant, austere, refined. <laughs> when it was in the cheap bottle, it was cheap, you know, fruitless, rancid, all the rest. So I mean, you know, this is very easy to pick on wine critics. This is something that happens to all of us all the time. You know, what we perceive is, is very much a product of, of what we think we're going to perceive. So to paraphrase Paul Simon, a man tastes what he wants to taste or sees what he wants to see mm -hmm. and disregards the rest. Mm -hmm. Now one thing that I've never quite understood is why computers, until I guess the, um, the game with Kasparov, couldn't beat grandmaster chess players. I mean, computers have all of, I mean, chess is a game it's a game of rationality, no? Yeah. And, you know, you have all of this power behind these big blue computers, um, and still a human being was able to beat a computer at chess. How did that happen? Well, Gary Kasparov can now, I mean, he's, he's probably, when he uh, fought Deep Blue, the IBM supercomputer to a draw, it was generally hailed as, you know, triumph of the machine, computers are smarter than people, he was the best chess player in the world, and he can't even beat a bundle of silicon microchips. If you talk to a scientist, though, I think most scientists are kind of shocked, as you put it, that the computer didn't just blow Gary Kasparov out of the water. And I think, you know, what that comparison really misses is, is just how efficient Gary Kasparov's mind is. I mean, think about it this way, that's Deep Blue is, can, can roughly compute 10, 10 million more moves per second than Gary Kasparov's very limited rational brain. So it's a much more powerful machine from the sheer computational perspective. Even more important, it consumes tons of energy. I mean, Deep Blue is a fire hazard. It requires specialized <laughs> heat dissipating equipment. It consumes thousands of dollars worth of energy every hour. Gary Kasparov's brain, meanwhile, room temperature, 98.6 <laughs> degrees, consumes as much electricity as a 20 watt light bulb. And yet he can fight this machine to a draw. And I think that gets back to just why the human brain is so amazing, why it's so efficient. And, and I talk in the book about this gets back to how the brain learns, how it sees in terms of patterns and predictions and 
dopamine neurons and the prediction error signal and all these ways that allow the brain to really very efficiently see patterns in the real world and to learn from those patterns. Um, and, and, that's, and that's something that supercomputers, at least until very recently, haven't been able to fully make use of. I think it's only the last couple of years that you've started to see computer programs like, for example, the best backgammon player in the world right now is actually a computer that can run on a very ordinary laptop. And that's because this backgammon program uses